everyone. This is I should be writing 527. Um, today is a little weird because I had a migraine in the middle of the night and I had insomnia and then I took a migraine pill this morning so the migraine's gone. Yay, no pain. But I'm a little out of it, which is why the screen you just saw said lunchtime AMA instead of I should be writing number 527. And I haven't changed the uh, subject of this here stream itself. So that's fun. Uh, hopefully people will find it regardless. Um, my name is Mer. This is I Should Be Writing as best as I can do it. I asked for topics on Twitter and I got several likes and one retweet. The retweet probably helped the most, but still <laughs> nobody gave me any ideas. So, uh, we're going to be winging it today, which is kind of fun. And I don't even know if my mic is right. Is my mic right? Can you guys hear me? The mic, the mic is, is not, not right. right. Damn it. Now the mic is right. Okay, that just sounded at least a little better. Um, I, the, the, the stream on Tuesday was a hot mess audio wise because I did not know that the new stream software I was using was grabbing the internal mic and not this here fancy thing. So when I was trying to edit the audio for the podcast it was very bad. So I apologize for anybody downloading that and I apologize for anybody listening the past couple of minutes before I realized that this was also grabbing the wrong mic, but it's easier to fix, at least. Um, to say hello to people in chat. Punk Junk and Jazz, hey. Todd, hey. Good to see you all. Billy Boy, good to see you. HRHS Hockey. Been listening to these for a while. This is my first time catching it live. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, K. Kimmy, Underpope. Mosetti. Collectorian. Awesome. Brenny, Sybil Rose, Remick Petra. Yay, lots of people. Lots of people here watching me be off for a day. But, you know, I think the previous uh, three episodes went okay. People seemed to get something out of them, even though it was less of me teaching and more of me exploring uh, outlining systems with you and showing you which ones really didn't work for me. Oops. Um, but anyway, I hope people got something out of that. I'm willing to check out any other craft book and talk about it before NaNoWriMo if you want me to. Just let me know in the chat, or if you're listening to this or watching this later, then uh, let me know via email, mightymer at gmail.com. What I've been up to is I am... Um, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about the secret project I've been alluding to. It's nothing like big and fancy but it's small and fun and personal to me. I'm just doing an audio drama and I haven't done one of those since 2007. So that's been just a lot of fun to explore because dialogue, I think, anyway, is where I'm strongest. And if it's not where I'm strongest, it's where I'm most comfortable. So uh, script writing is fun. I should probably do more of it, but I'm doing an audio drama. That's fun. Um. Sorry, actually, people are asking questions. It's exciting. Uh, Hockey5 says, How has your podcasting twitching impacted your writing career? Would you recommend a new writer invest time in launching a podcast or stream? I don't know. Uh, I'm coming from a place where I had an established audience. Um, I built my audience starting in 2004, so I can't it's really hard for me to advise anybody doing a new podcast right now because the saying the landscape is different is, you know, it's like the frontier versus what LA is now. It's, it's so different. Um, as for streaming, I started kind of with my own, with an established audience, but the crossover has not been, um, quite what I wanted it to be, but it is happening, and I'm very grateful to people who have checked out Twitch, specifically because I started doing this. I think 
the real benefit to me has been it's made me more excited about creating and it's forced me to stay on a schedule because if I tell people I'll be here at 1230 and I'm not here, that's that's not cool. And and for some reason, in my mind, that's different than me saying, I'll, I'll post a podcast on Tuesday. It's very specific and it's forcing me to stick to the schedule. I am scheduling my life around this. I'm not making sure not to have anything going on at this time. And so it's it's keeping me consistent, which is good. Um, if you have a problem with consistency, then I recommend Twitch if the schedule is something you can stick with. Um, and I think it's made the podcast better simply because I'm having more fun and I'm having direct interaction with people where before I wasn't and it was just a person and a mic and I know that I have a very loyal fan base and I love you all but I think new people are, are looking for more dynamic stuff happening in podcasts uh, especially multiple uh, hosts so I have that in my other podcast Ditch Diggers which I just got done recording and but for I Should Be Writing, it's always just been me. But now with Twitch, I have the live chat and people can ask me questions or say hi. And that interaction is giving me more life. So personally, I think it's made me more creative in that it's just a new medium for me to play with. And it's helping me stick to a schedule, which I've had trouble doing for a couple of years. Um, as a new writer, it depends on what you want to get out of it. I've tried live write-ins. I tried it once. I think it's still on my schedule, actually. Whoops. Need to fix that. Um, and it didn't work because I can't find an ergonomic setup that works with recording. So, I mean, I have to be comfortable writing and be comfortable recording. And right now, I'm at a very non-ergonomic desk. Um, but it fits all my recording stuff and the green screen and the lighting and all that. I don't have to mess with the actual office. So I have to figure out, but people said they got a lot out of the live write in. So if you want to do, take your writing to Twitch and make it a, an accountability thing, that might be interesting for you. But I'm sorry I can't help with starting a new podcast because I honestly wouldn't know where to start. Um, back in the old days, it was find people who podcast stuff kind of like you, make a promo and see if they'll play it. I don't know if that still works. I don't know if people do that anymore. I'm feeling very old and I'm going to start shaking my cane at the clouds and at the darn kids. Um, I got a lot out of the outlining episodes, even with audio only, so thanks for doing those. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I did get the video uploaded to YouTube, so if you'd like to see the video, even though you've already listened to the audio, um, you can check that out over there. Uh, Mr. Inktail, hey, how are you? Have you ever heard of the book Lolita by Nabokov? What are your thoughts on books that have controversial <laughs> subject matter? I don't know if you're kidding or not. Because I just covered Lolita. I don't know if you're kidding. Controversial subject matter, sure, that's fine. Personally, I didn't like Lolita. Um, and at the time, I had a nine-year-old daughter. So that was even just trying to read it from the point of view of somebody who wants to prey on a child is... couldn't get through it. Controversial subject matter... I don't believe in censorship... Hate speech is another thing. I don't want to get on that. But um, I've talked about this before. There have been... Um, there are lots of books that cover sexual assault, for example. I don't like reading that. But I do know that there are people who have found healing for their own uh, past trauma through books like that. Um, so... There's always something to get out of a book. John Milton wrote um, his pamphlet, Arapagitica, and <laughs> it's dense as hell and really hard to read, but 
the things he says in it is, um, it's funny how it's not really talked about these days. You know, people talk about Paradise Lost, but his political pamphlet, Arapagitica, talked about censorship because they'd passed a, I don't remember what they called it. If you weren't here at the beginning, I will mention again that I am on migraine meds, so I'm going to be a little loopy. Um, but they they passed a law after they overthrew the throne in England about censorship, and Milton did not like that. And so he wrote this very long, very detailed, careful pamphlet so it wouldn't get censored, and he wouldn't get arrested, and basically saying that if you expose yourself to something that the church says is bad, it's a test. And if you come out still knowing your truth, you know, in their case it was religion, um, then you're stronger than somebody who's like pure and doesn't know the evil that's out there. And so I think even, I take that even to just reading books I don't like, in that I can probably learn something from this, even if it's uh, showing the other side to galvanize my own beliefs or something, but um, sure, if people find Lolita a great piece of work, that's, that's awesome. Nabokov was very influential with all of his work. Um, not for me. But yeah, sorry to get on the Arapagitica thing. It's really hard for me to talk about it because, like I said, it's extremely dense and I haven't, you know, I I understood it really well when I was taking Milton back in Mumble Mumble, or 19 Mumble Mumble, as I should say. Um, but what I remember is the thought of exposing yourself to something that is harmful, that other people say is harmful, such as something the church does not approve of, and then coming out the other side, like having digested that and still knowing your truth, that makes you stronger. And I take that away from the whole religious idea of it, but I try to internalize that. Um, it's still educational to see... Oh, back to the outlining. People found some uh, uh, use out of it. That's great. Hey, Pablo. Outlining series is awesome. Thank you. That's that's very nice. Um, audio drama sounds fun. It is fun to do. Um, Collectonian. I so feel that. I did one where it was grabbing my webcam mic and my headset mic. I could not fix that audio at all. Oh, Grabbing both? Oh, that's awful. Um, how did you plot your audio drama? Serials? Short stories? What's the lag between edited script and actual release of the audio? Uh, hi, uh, Silent Wolf. Glad you're here. Um, right now, I'm just doing the script as it comes to me. I actually don't know the plot. I'm a little worried, except for that I'm a pantser, so I'm pretty sure I'll come up with something once I start writing scene three. Uh, the first scene was introducing one character and a little of her backstory and the second scene is uh, introducing another character and his backstory. Um, so yeah, I, I have no plans for timeline or anything. That's that's the beauty of doing something absolutely for yourself. You know, you don't have to stick to a schedule. But um, my plan would be to get probably, probably about halfway into it to where I know the end and then I'll be looking for people to do it with me and do it. Um, I have another aspect of it I haven't mentioned that I will keep to myself right now, but um, see if they're able to do the, the extra stuff I need. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, but if you're doing it and it's like a big project, then I would definitely write all of the scripts first and make sure that's solid before you start recording. When you start recording, give yourself four out, what, however long the episode is, it will take four times that amount of time to edit it all together. That's pretty much what I discovered. 
So that, that's my basic information on that. Um, I'm sorry I'm behind in chat because I'm getting talky. Uh, Pablo, I guess you touched on the outlining methods before. I mean, audio only, I should be writing. The visual element helps a lot. Okay. Yes, I have touched on them. I haven't touched story grid, but clearly that one was difficult for me anyway. So that's probably why. Billy Boy, streaming is good because it adds another dimension to your podcast. I agree. Under Pope, I too enjoy the outlining videos. Bought the Save the Cat because of it. Man, I did not get a kickback for that. And thank you for reminding me to take my pill. Yes, for you, those of you listening, um, I have automatic uh, Nightbot chats going through occasionally. Promoting myself, promoting my work, but also saying do some self-care, hydrate, take your meds, all that stuff. Uh, Kay Kimmy, a while ago you mentioned you were reading some entrepreneurial books. Would you recommend any of them? I don't know, because it depends on what you're doing. I I am not finding it easy to um, relate the entrepreneurial outlook to what I do. Because a lot of it has to do with customers, and I don't have any. And I can't really see my audience as customers. At least not in the book I was thinking about because the one I was the one I was reading at the time was like you need to look at like your worst customers are probably the ones that are taking the most of your time. What you want to do is you identify your best customers, get rid of the other ones, and then just focus on your you know focus on doing your best customers and all that. And I'm like that doesn't really work for freelancers. So if you are like trying to build a writing career. I'm I'm finding productivity books being a little better than entrepreneurial books. Uh, some marketing books. I got the Seth Godin This Is Marketing and I got a little bit out of that because uh, there's this like big picture concept of if there's like a person doesn't want to buy a drill bit. A person wants to make a hole the size of the drill bit. Okay, the person doesn't really want the hole, they want to put up a shelf. And it goes like, for want of a nail, into they either want to impress or please someone in their family, they want to be happy about what they have created or organized, or the pleasure of cleaning up something because you've put up a shelf and you can put things on the shelf now. It's like big concept ideas of selling a drill bit. And I thought that was interesting. And that helps because I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, is like sometimes I feel unimportant because I write, a lot of what I write is funny. And very few humorists have been called important. It's considered lowbrow, humor's considered um, lowbrow easy. God, I don't know why people think it's easy. Um, I guess because the response is easy, and it's easy to read, but it's not easy to write. But when people tell me, it's like, I'm thinking I'm writing a joke about a vampire working in an office about a travel agency, and someone says, I was reading your book in the hospital sitting beside my dying mother and you made me laugh. And that is the big picture. So I'm not recommending a whole lot of entrepreneurial books, but the marketing does matter because I am trying to market myself, my podcast, my work, my books, all that stuff. Um, Mr. Inktail, when you're writing sci-fi, what's the balance between makeup science, theoretical science, and real science, what we know? I ask because I want to limit the amount of fact checkers breaking suspicion. Uh, I think you mean suspension of disbelief. You say suspicion. Um, I, I do a lot of hand wavy stuff. I, my, I'm pretty much writing science fantasy. I am not a scientist. I'm not a hard science lover. I um, I bounce off of a lot of the really hard science writers. 
Neil Stevenson, one of my favorite books of all time is The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, which is pretty hard science. But there's a point in the book, it's, it's about, uh, partly about a uh, very, very, very advanced primer to help raise uh, young women to be subversive. But instead of being in the hands of a very powerful person in royalty, it lands in the hands of like a street urchin and how it brings her up. And one of the things it teaches her is the Turing machine, because it wants to teach her programming later. The Turing machine chapter, oh, it was awful. It was very painful. But, um, I am able to get past that and still love the book itself, but mostly the hard science is not my cup of tea, and it's other people's cup of tea. So if you want to write hard science, I suggest read Stevenson, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, I think Lois McMaster Bujold writes a lot of hard science fiction, Elizabeth Baer does, um, and you know, don't, don't shy away from it. But what's really funny is for me, I, in six weeks, I hand waved the whole clone thing. I just made that stuff up. I fully admit it. I know people want to be at that level now. I mean, they're talking about like recording personalities, recording memories, uploading, all that stuff. But, you know, mine is like seamless and cheap because I cared more about the story I wanted to tell. What's really funny is I actually did some research in trying to build the space station or spaceship and the gravity that was created by the rotating body of the ship and the solar and cosmic cells that they used as um, sails on the ship to grab either solar or cosmic radiation depending on where they were in their travels. I did a lot of research on that and the first review they dinged me on the space travel and didn't say a thing about the cloning. The cloning, I mean, I just made all that stuff up. And I, I researched hard for the space travel, and I don't know. That's the thing. You don't know what people are going to attach themselves to to not like about your stuff. So just write. If you want to write hard science fiction, write hard science fiction. If you want to hand wave it, there are people out there who like that. And you're not, if you sell the book, your marketing team will know not to you know, compare you to Kim Stanley Robinson. So, you know, you just write what you want to write. Don't worry about the response because you can't control it and it will probably be something you don't anticipate. So you can't prepare for it. Just always get the caliber of your bullet right or say the gun's modified. That's apparently a very big deal. Uh, Diamond Age was great. Humor's the best, one of the best ways to connect with people. I wish I could do it better. Yeah, it's hard. I could talk about humor again. I have before. There's an excellent book on humor that uh, people say you can't teach it. You totally can. That was actually my, being able to teach humor was my uh, uh, thesis lecture in my MFA. Um, Diamond Age was great. Yes, it was. Genetic mutation is science, yet we have superheroes. Yes, Neil Stevenson's novels can be a mixed bag, indeed. Todd says, my problem with hard science fiction is that it dates stuff with current understanding of the science. When that changes, the stuff becomes outdated. That's true. Yeah, if you do hand-wavy stuff, it may never become real, so it's always fiction. Cryptonomicon was definitely a slong, though in the end I enjoyed it. Uh, I think internal consistency is the most important element. I agree. You know, I, I would rather have a plot that hangs together in characters I care about. But, you know, that's what I find important. There are people out there who find hard science fiction important who do not agree with me. And that's cool. They read what they read, and I read what I read. Um, uh, Talkie Meat, hello. 
My preference is to use made-up science only as much as necessary for the plot, but no more. So if the story needs FTL travel, I'll make some stuff up, but otherwise I try to keep it accurate. Um. Yeah, I... I pretty much put in anything I need to as long as I can back it up with, as uh, was said, the consistency. It's... I like writing whatever I can imagine. Um... And I know there are people who very much don't like that. Like, people who want only real science fiction as in projected, which means no FTL ever. Which I think is limiting. So you want to call my book Science Fantasy? That's fine. I'm cool with that. I don't, I don't mind. Um, I just want people to read it and enjoy it. I find Stevenson's didactic bits a little slog if it's stuff I already know. <laughs> um, I think sometimes when they're trying, it sounds like they're trying to either teach me or show off what they researched is when I lose interest. And also, you know, trying to teach a Turing machine with a fantasy story for a child was not, didn't work for me. I like the idea, but it didn't work for me. Um, we had a comment in uh, Discord. I said, I had a migraine insomnia, and now migraine drugs, so does anybody have anything they want me to cover? And we got um, uh, Mazetli tips for getting back on track after a bad day, especially for nano. I have a really hard time turning my day around when something unexpected happens, for example. So usually that means no writing or something. I will... I will give advice with the caveat that I have problems with this too. And this is usually when my, um... Yeah, phased out. Sorry, I don't have that command in there. Um, I have Discord available for the Patreon supporters. Um, I'm been trying to think if I should do a Discord for now that I have Twitch, but I don't have uh, one connected right now. And hey, Phased Out, good to see you. Um, here's what I'm thinking. When I miss a day, I usually go into the math and I say, okay, so since I missed today, I have to do, take the leftover days and add a little bit of words to every single day. And I found that that doesn't work for me. I think that, that it's possible I'm, I'm thinking too far ahead or I'm realizing that that one missed day has added work to every single other day this month. And that sucks. It's hard to know how I approach it because I'm not... It's not a conscious thought. I just know that this is what I do and then I crash and burn later. As that number goes up as I miss days. So... Going back to one of the productivity books I talked about a couple of podcasts back, um... I can't remember which one it was, but somebody was saying a lot of people feel like if they're trying to do something, trying to make a new habit or something, and they fall off the wagon, that they're done. They're, they've completely lost. I ate cake yesterday, I'm going to eat cake today because I suck. I didn't write yesterday, NaNoWriMo's totally gone. The thing is, is that everybody has days like that. What you want to do is only have one day like that. So if you miss today, that's fine. Just make sure you write tomorrow. And think about it that way. And if you are in a good, you're having a good day writing, throw in some more words. The days off will appreciate it. Again, I'm just spitballing here because I have problems with that. Missing a day and feeling completely off track and then trying to space out, okay, well, I just added 200 words to every day, that's not bad. Okay, well, I've missed five days, so I've added a thousand words to every day, that is bad. 
and then I get crushed. So, um, I'm going to try to do the, okay, you miss one day, don't miss the next. And then see what you could do to make up for it, but don't, like, fill that dumpster, or fill your dump truck too full. That's a very bad metaphor. Backpack. Fill your backpack too full. Sure. Too full of words. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking of doing. Um, I need the productivity book that comes with leashes and muzzles for my kids. <laughs> now, you want a million dollar idea. That is the million dollar idea. That's, yeah. I... I don't know if you guys are doing it. I, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but, you know, in trying to look at the silver lining of 2020, I've been thinking, I'm so lucky that my daughter is an age that I don't need to, you know, be hands-on all the time. I feel for the people with kids at home who have to deal with homeschooling and work and keeping a house and all of that. I just, I, I ache for you guys because... I lucked out. The only thing that would have been luckier is that she was one year older because she missed out on all of her senior year stuff. So if she'd been missing out on freshman year stuff, that'd be fine. Missing out on senior year stuff, that kind of sucked. But, um, yeah. Got to take a nap before my day fully starts, Mr. Inktail says. So one last question. I have a fantasy story where a human falls in love with a dragon. However, they meet when the human is 15 to 16. So how do I approach the romantic aspect without it seeming creepy or like the dragon is grooming the human? Um, well, if they meet when the human is younger, then you establish a connection there and... If they if they grow up together, at some point the dragon's going to have to be startled that they see the human in a different way, not not a slow growth of love, but just like realizing there's someone different now that they've grown up, they've they've matured, or connect with them on a teenager level and then maybe time apart to have the kid grow and create their own. mature on their own terms and not the dragon's terms and then come back together and then it's it's uh more acceptable i would say um talking meat i need the productivity book that comes with a leash oh sorry unleash and muzzle to my brain um or maybe just like for youtube unleash and muzzle for youtube people say the freedom app works i did not find it useful. I don't know what, what my problem with the Freedom app was, but it was, I don't know. It just didn't work for me. I think um, what I really needed was more device locking capabilities, and Apple took the ability for other apps to block apps away. So the Freedom app that said it could stop you from opening the Twitter app or the YouTube app, it didn't work anymore. Um, and I didn't really need it on my desktop. But if you use your desktop for a lot of the time-wasting sites, maybe look into that. Gosh, you guys are coming up with all the talky things. I really appreciate this. When you wrote the Star Wars solo book, how did you get the character voices right when you hadn't seen the movie ahead of time? Um, that's a good question. Well, I had the script, and, you know, when it when it's filmed, you've got the actor and the director creating the voice lines, um, and the way they, they pull that off, and, and just reading the script, I had, you know, my interpretation, I got lucky that they were often the same, 
Uh, there were a couple of times when I know that Ron Howard was brought on because the original directors were making it too campy, but a lot of the dialogue that was funny was left in, and I played it as humor, and Ron Howard did not. And that really surprised me when, like, a line was said, and I'm like, no one's laughing because it wasn't funny. The line was funny when I read it in the script. It's not funny now. Okay. But I, you know, you. I got the job because I know Star Wars. And, you know, I mean, this was born in 73. Star Wars was my life growing up. Just, you know, it was huge. And so the, the voice of Han Solo and how Chewie responds to things just kind of, that that's deep in the the brain where you know I can't remember a phone number today um so that part was easy so that's that's pretty much it um I lucked out a little bit and used what I knew of Han Solo already uh 12 four and a baby I weep for my free time oh lord you are Yes. I weep for your free time too, but you can do it. It'll come back. At some point, you will have free time again. I don't know your kids, so I can't tell you when, but it will happen. Billy Boy, I found if you split up the NaNoWriMo word count into several segments, it makes getting the total word count for the day easier. Interesting. Um... Collectonian, if your router software has the option, you could lock your devices out of the internet for set periods of time. Yes. Okay, Kimmy, I had to get a new phone the other day, Samsung, and the app timer feature is going to pay for itself, I swear. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think actually you can do a screen time lock for um, iOS devices. I actually found the, um, I talked about it before, The I bought a plastic it's supposed to be for the kitchen but you can put anything in it if it fits uh, just a lock box with a timer and you know it showed people putting cookies in there or alcohol or uh, devices so I bought it for when I was really addicted to Animal Crossing I would you know put it in there first thing in the morning so I couldn't look at it until afternoon and that actually helped a lot and strangely enough, once it was locked in there, I didn't want it because I knew I absolutely couldn't have it. It wasn't a question of willpower, it was a question of, well, that that's just not happening. Um, but I don't know if you can do that to your phone or your tablet or your computer. That worked for the Switch. Um... Cromag, thank you for the subscription. Appreciate it. Now we're talking about dragons and app timers. Still trying to find my mojo I lost last year. About to go through Around the Writer's Block book again. Any other suggestions? I haven't actually finished Around the Writer's Block, but I have really enjoyed what I've read. I think it's got a lot of good stuff to um, tell people. I don't know what else for getting Mojo back. Um, I have to look into that. I'm actually going to write that down, so I will remember to bring it up next week. I will. I have a pen and a pencil stuck together. Um, yeah, I'll write that down and try to come up with something. Uh, better block books. Okay. The Artist's Way, of course, yeah. The Artist's Way, I, I've done The Artist's Way successfully once. Um, tried to do it again this spring, and uh, COVID fatigue and stress just kind of dragged me down, and I lost it about week five, which is where I usually lose it. Um, I was trying to do Finding Water, which is the more um, mid-career Artist's Way she's got, which is, I mean, really useful. But uh, had a lot of I, one thing we got out of that was I had a lot to say about 
the dreaded week four of the artist's way and I realized the problem I have with week four of the artist's way. If you haven't done the artist's way, it has, you know, rules like you need to journal three, uh, three pages a day, first thing in the morning. It can be anything you want. It can even be, I don't want to write this. But you just do a brain dump. They call it morning pages. And then you do a walk every week and you do an artist date every week, which is really hard to do now that COVID is here. Um, but like go out by yourself and get something that's fulfilling. Art museum is an obvious thing, but also like a fabric store or a garden or something just to revitalize you creatively. Upon reading this, this, you know, during pandemic times, it was, you know, that whole, wow, we take a lot for granted, don't we? Um, but every week it gives you things to do and things to think about. But week four is the one that everybody hates because the con basically she wants you to get bored and she wants, when you get bored, your brain gets, uh, your brain gets to work, which is, you know, some people have said that's a bad thing about all our devices and the internet is that we're not bored very often and it's hard to create new things when instead of working on creating things, your brain's like, oh, where can I get more content? But, uh, so on week four, she says, don't read anything. And I'm pretty sure she means any media. It's not like you can just sit in front of the TV all week. Don't read anything. And she keeps saying, like, every class I teach, everyone steps up. No, I can't read. I have to read for my job, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, you can do this. I'm like, this is where it sounds, this, you got a whole, like, privilege thing here. But also... It sounds like she's talking about people doing artist's way in a vacuum, like a retreat. If you're doing a retreat, then sure. You got a 12 week retreat to do the artist's way. Week four, you empty your cabin of things to read. Sure, that works. But in an everyday life, it's not, it's, it's not feasible. Not for a week. And I think once I realized that that's the perfect case scenario she's talking about and it really does do your brain good to be bored once in a while, but man, I can't stand that week four. But I really do like the artist's way overall, trust me, I just stay week four. Um, oh, gotta run to a meeting, good to see you, Todd. Okay, Kimmy, I didn't technically finish it, but even just getting halfway helped me a lot. Yeah, it's it's got some really good stuff in it. And if you are, you know, uh, watching this and you're more mid-career like me, uh, Finding Water has a lot of good stuff in it because, I mean, it talks about the stumbles you have as a creative person even after your career has started, which is very useful. Um... Uh, Collectonian, uh, oh, what's my streaming schedule? I want to make sure I tune in for future streams. Thank you. Um, streaming schedule is I do this podcast Tuesday, Thursday, 1230 Eastern time. Um, because I'm an author and a podcaster and an editor, I just do a general chatty AMA on Mondays at 1230. We're just basically hanging out chatting. And then I do gaming Thursday nights and Sunday afternoons. Um, right now I'm doing How to Full Boyfriend, which is the very strange Japanese dating game where I'm a human dating pigeons, uh, at Thursdays and either Stardew Valley or Oxygen Not Included on Sunday afternoons. So that's my streaming schedule. It'll be once, uh, November comes and then Orimo starts, I'll be doing live write-ins on, um, during the stream time. So that's going to change for November, but overall, that's my schedule. Thank you for asking. Um, oh, wow, I couldn't even do no reading for a day. My sweetie and I communicate primarily by email when we're not together. Yeah, see, that's, that's the thing. It's, if, if you, it's like not speaking for a week. Yeah, I know people who go to meditation retreats and don't speak the whole time. It's because they're on retreat and that's, they can focus on that. But, you know, it's, 
It would be so much easier to say, don't watch a screen. That would be a challenge that maybe you could do, except for work, but, I mean, the challenge to not look at your phone or tablet for recreation would be hard but feasible. Reading is something else. It's text, it's emails, it's communication, it's news, it's, I mean, it's, it goes beyond reading for entertainment. It's just, I mean, I'm reading right now as I'm talking to you guys. Am I an editor with a publisher or a freelance editor? I am a magazine editor. I am co-editor of Escape Pod, the science fiction podcast magazine. So we do short fiction weekly. EscapePod.org. It's a free science fiction audio and e on the site. You can read it. Um, have you ever played Among Us? Murder in a Spaceship <laughs> sounds familiar. I've I've heard that before. Actually, um, I like watching people play Among Us. I don't think I would enjoy it. I um, I don't like the board game. I'm a big board game player, and I do not like the board games where one person is the betrayer. I I don't think I like games that um have the the secret betrayer element. I don't like games where if it's supposed to be cooperative, someone's going to be betray me. I just don't like it. So, um I like watching Among Us, but I don't think I would enjoy playing it. Favorite board game that is That's tough. Right now, probably Terraforming Mars, but favorite tabletop game would be The Crew, hands down. The Crew is a German game that just came out, I think, last year. It came out in Germany last year. My husband bought it and imported it, and it came out in the U.S. this year, I believe. It's a cooperative trick-taking game. If you know what a trick-taking game is, you'll wonder what the challenge is, because the the way you play the game is, you know, everyone puts a card down and the highest card wins the trick. And so how do you make that into a cooperative game? Well, you make it so you can't communicate your cards. And what you do communicate is um, you deal out all the cards and then you find, you from another deck, you flip over a card and it's like, okay, somebody's got to take the red seven. And uh, there's a card that indicates who the commander is, and so the commander would get that job. If the commander has the red seven and nothing else, that's going to be tough. If the commander has uh, no reds, that's going to be tough. It's um, a lot of communi like trying to communicate by... You're able to... Sometimes you're able to tell people what card you have if it's the highest lowest or only card. So if all you have is the red seven, you can put the red seven down and put a token on it indicating this is all I have, so we all have to work together, so I pick this back up. But, and then it's got 50 different, uh, they call them missions, because it's a space sta uh, space trip uh, simulation. So every mission changes. So the first game, it's really easy. You the commander has to take the card you flip over. But then it gets more and more complex. And it is ridiculously fun. And there's no secret betrayer. So I'm all for that. So The Crew is what it's called. It's just a very simple card game. If you know how to play trick-taking games, you'll pick it up pretty fast. As a writer, how do you select beta readers and how important do you think they are? Um, I actually... I don't use beta readers. I I tried earlier in my career and found it's hard making somebody fit your schedule of needs. Basically, handing somebody a book to read and get comments back to you is a lot harder than you think it is. And I basically sent it out, sent my book out to a lot of people 
a lot of people I trusted, and I didn't get one comment back. And it wasn't a bad book. So I kind of stopped using them at that point, and now I have my agent and later my editor to help me work through a draft. I do know some people, like Gail Carriger, um, she has a very tight uh, relationship with her community, and she um, has an, pulled her beta readers from her most passionate fans, and she says that works for her very well. So I've considered doing that, but um, yeah, I haven't. I, I know beta readers are very important to some people, but I have just not had luck with them. And I understand sometimes I'm bad at blurbing or beta reading because, you know, somebody else's first draft novel is not my highest priority. Commenting on somebody else's is, you know, it's a favor. It's not a huge priority thing. And I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm saying other people see my books like that too, and that's fine. But uh, just haven't had luck. Other people have. So I think they're important if you get a lot out of the comments, if you trust who you're giving it to. Um, one time I sent, there was a short story I'd been wanting to write for a long time. It came from a dream. That's your first red flag. And I struggled through it, and I sent it to a friend I'd made at Bible Paradise. And he basically tore it to shreds, which was good because I got it out of my system and I didn't think about writing it anymore. And um, he was right, like I said. It's really hard to write from a dream because a dream is your mind often creating visuals based on emotions. And somehow it may make, it may connect you with something absolutely ridiculous like an apple. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, that's bad. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, and if you try to write that story about that apple that means so much to you, it's going to be tough. Some people can do it. I couldn't do it for the dream that I had. And my friend pointed that out to me. And, and that was actually a place where beta readers helped and I didn't continue with the project. But it's just a short story, not a huge project. Uh, the crew sounds like fun. I'll have to check it out. Board games in person with friends is something I'm really missing with COVID. Are you playing on Board Game Arena? Board Game Arena has saved our game night. We do it every week. We try to do it every week. And um, it's got a lot of really good games. And actually, last night we found out it has the crew in beta. So we ran through a couple hands with a friend and not finding any problems with it. So very excited. Check out BoardGameArena.com. This is not sponsored. This is just an endorsement because it's awesome. What we do is we do a hangout call, or I guess you could do a Zoom call, but we do a hangout call to all of our friends on our tablet so we can see everybody, and then we play on our computers. And it is not exactly the same, but, you know, my friends like the fact that they can see us and not have our dogs, like, come up and nose their crotches or lick their elbows. They're good dogs. They're just very friendly. Um... I find it hard to find critique partners. I can only imagine how hard it is to find beta readers. Yeah. Especially with no career. The thing is, actually, I think when nobody has a career, you might you might find it easier because everybody wants... If, it, if it's like a writing group, that's different. Um, and... Again, this was years ago, and I don't. I need to look into like the onwriter, online writers workshop, but because it's definitely changed since you know the early two thousands when I started using it. But um, I remember they had a you you earned uh, tokens when you did somebody else's critique, so you had to do four critiques to earn your own critique. So in that way, they forced everybody to make sure you gave more than you got. So everybody got critiqued. And um, I think that was an excellent way of doing it. And when you join the site, it gives you like a, a handful of free critiques so you don't have to start doing the work immediately. You can get your critique and see how that works for you. Um, 
when I used to beta read for friends, I would take forever to get it back to the author just by procrastination. Yeah, it's tough. Tabletop simulator and Discord voice chat is what we use. Yeah, phased out. That's another that's another good one. We found great luck with Board Game Arena, but I've heard good stuff about Tabletop Simulator. But I am coming up on an hour, and you guys have given me a lot of awesome stuff to talk about. Um, is there anything else you would like me to touch on before I take my leave and get some more water and some lunch? Let me know. Uh, I've never had a writing group before. I've always wanted one, but I'm not a social person, highly introverted. And just don't know many writers in person. I think that's where the internet helps you. And right now is the best time because it's not like... I mean, everyone's looking for a writing group because nobody can meet in person. And if you are meeting in person, it's dangerous and I don't recommend it. Unless you go through a lot of precautions where it's probably just easier to meet online anyway. Um... So if nobody else has any other thoughts... Um, this has been I Should Be Writing. The live chat has made it so much easier than I thought it would be. Thank you all so much for your questions and your comments. Um, and I'm doing much better. I'm just, like, a little slow on migraine meds. I'm not actually sick or anything. Uh, but if you want to learn more about me, you can see me at merverse.com. And this Twitch channel is twitch.tv slash mightymer if you want to catch the next live show, which will be next Tuesday at 12.30 Eastern Time. Uh, favorite resources on editing for fiction writes, writers? Ooh. I will have to get back to you on that. Um, the I just did a review of the story grid, so that I think that might be a good place to start if you have a completed manuscript. Um, I hate editing and have not found a ton of books that have made me like it anymore, but I will look into that because I think it's a really good question and probably something we could all use after NaNoWriMo. So uh, I will be looking up editing books and beating writer's block books. And I will come back to you on Tuesday with some more thoughts on that. Um, sorry I can't answer immediately, but nothing springs to mind beyond the story grid, which I uh, just went over as I thought it was an outlining method, and it turns out it's probably better for a rough draft editing method. So check out the story grid if you haven't, or check out uh, my video on it I did on Tuesday. But uh, thank you all so much for listening, either chatting on Twitch or lurking on Twitch. I appreciate you all. I appreciate you listening at home. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, I appreciate you too. I thank everybody who takes time out of their day to give me a listen. So uh, check out my stuff if you like. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you tonight if you want to watch me date pigeons. Otherwise, I'll be chatting more uh, nonfiction stuff on uh, lunchtime next week. Take care. And you should be writing. Don't forget that part. <laughs>